Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we're going to return to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're back to our study of the book of Numbers within that larger study. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 26. We'll be there in just a few moments. Uh, but as always, if you have any questions, any comments or concerns about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, or if you're something that you want me to be praying about personally, we just want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. And we're so thankful to those of you who have reached out to us in the past and continue to do so on a regular basis. It is always good to hear from you. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers. Tonight we hope to do a pretty brief study of Numbers chapters 26 and 27. And if you've been with us in this series, then you know that we've been moving rather quickly through this because I really don't want us to get too bogged down in the details of God's people wandering in the wilderness. There's a lot of other stuff in the Bible that we need to be studying as well. There's a value to this, uh, but we're not going to spend a whole year studying from the book of Numbers. Well, in the Big picture by way of review, Numbers is a book of numbers. Imagine that. And the book of Numbers, we have Moses conducting a census of the people two times, once at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness, and again toward the end of the wandering in the wilderness. And tonight we're going to come to the second census. And by way of review, last week we looked at the deception that was perpetrated by Balaam. Uh, there was a local king, King Balak, who is terrified of the Israelites camped out in his area. And for good reason. I think he can look around. He can see what's been happening. Uh, God's people have wiped a number of surrounding nations off the face of the earth, and he's obviously pretty concerned about that. And so King Balak hires Balaam the prophet to curse the Israelites. Balaam is a for-profit prophet, so Balaam really wants to do this. He wants the payout for doing this, and yet as hard as he tries, God will not allow him to curse the people. And so Balaam, as we understand it, combining a few verses from the Old and the New together, Balaam finds a workaround. And the workaround is this. If King Balak can tempt God's people to sin, and if they sin, God will then punish his people for sinning which accomplishes the same thing as if they had been cursed. And that's what he does. The locals then, at Balaam's suggestion, seduce God's people into sacrificing to Baal. And then on top of that, they tempt them into committing sexual sin. And God does indeed punish the people. I think, uh, I think it's around 24,000 people die in the process in this plague. Until, of course, a guy named Phineas uh, comes up and he sees... <clears throat> an Israelite and a Moabite woman come in together, daughters of the leaders of their people, and they are really close. They might have been fornicating, uh, but they're so close that he spears two of those perpetrators simultaneously, and that brings the plague to an end. I think God is pretty impressed with the zeal of Phineas, and he gets a promotion. So this now brings us to the second census, the second of the two. And this brings us to Numbers 26. Let's take a look at the first 11 verses. Numbers 26, <clears throat> verses 1 through 11. Then it came about after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel from 20 years old and upward by their father's households, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel. So Moses and Eleazar the priest spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Take a census of the people from twenty years old and upward, as the Lord has commanded Moses. Now the sons of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt were Reuben, Israel's firstborn, the sons of Reuben, of Hanak, the family of the Hanakites, of Palu, the family of the Paluites, of Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, of Carmi, the family of the Carmites, these are the families of the Reubenites, and those who were numbered of them were 43,730. The son of Palu, Eliab. The sons of Eliab, Nemuel, and Dathan, and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram who were called by the congregation, who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah, when they contended against the Lord, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, along with Korah, when that company died, when the fire devoured 250 men, so that they became a warning." The sons of Korah, however, did not die. 
Just again, by way of review, the book of Numbers starts with the first census in Numbers 1, verse 2. If you want to go back and look at that when it's in chapter 1. So basically, most of Numbers 1 is just a listing of the tribes along with the numbers of fighting men in each tribe. And that is exactly what we find here. Roughly 40 years later, they do it again. Remember, due to a lack of faith on the part of the ten spies, God promised that an entire generation would die in the wilderness, and they did. And so now we are accounting for those deaths, and we're going to notice a change in the numbers. And as we start looking at the census figures here, we find that they are camped out across the Jordan River from the city of Jericho. So that tells us that they are right there. They are right on the verge of crossing over. And that also tells us that the census is one of the last things that they do. And I think for most nations, a census is a pretty big deal. Uh, here in the U.S., our Constitution has us take a census for the purpose of representation in Congress. We do that every 10 years. And in ancient Israel, the point was not represent, uh, representation in Congress. The point was to figure out how many people they had who could fight. So they were basically organizing their fighting force before crossing over the Jordan to take the Promised Land. And in the census, they are counting the people 20 years old and older. We're not going to look at every verse in this chapter, but we're just looking at the first tribe, the tribe of Reuben, as an example. So we've got the name of the tribe, Reuben, but Reuben is long gone. He's long since passed away. So these are the descendants of Reuben. Uh, we're given a number of family names, kind of sub-clans or sub-families within the larger tribe. And then we've got this figure of 43,730. And uh, from time to time in this whole chapter, we're going to have a special note. And we have a special note here, a little historical note going on. Some from the tribe of Reuben were those who were caught up in Korah's rebellion and those who died when the earth swallowed up Korah and his followers. So a little... A uh, note of history, by the way, kind of thing going on here. Well, we could continue with the tribes of Simeon and Judah and Issachar and the others, and we could just read name after name tonight, and we could be here for an hour and a half reading those names. But let's not do that, okay? So we're going to skip over a few things, and let's skip over to the grand total. Over in Numbers 26, let's look at verses 51 through 56. Numbers 26, 51 through 56. These are those who were numbered of the sons of Israel, 601,730. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Among these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To the larger group you shall increase their inheritance, and to the smaller group you shall diminish their inheritance. Each shall be given their inheritance according to those who were numbered of them. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. According to the selection by lot, their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and the smaller groups. So notice there at the beginning, the grand total of the fighting age men at the end of the 40 years, therefore, is 601,730. All right, so if we go back to Numbers 1, verse 46, the grand total at the beginning of the 40 years was 603,550 for a loss of 1,820 men. And it's interesting to me that they only lose that many men. Remember, basically everyone 20 years old and older dies, except for Joshua and Caleb. We're going to review that in just a moment. But the people continue having children during those 40 years, of course. And so the total at the end, I would say, is pretty close to the total at the beginning, within 2,000 men. And remember, we're only dealing with the fighting age men here. So when you add the men who are younger, the men who may be too old to fight, and then when you add the women and children, that's where we come up with a figure of roughly 2 to 3 million people. We don't have that total figure. We just know the fighting men at the end of the 40 years are 601,730. Well, in the rest of this passage, the Lord gives Moses some guidance concerning how to divide the land once they cross over. So bigger tribes are going to get more of an inheritance, smaller tribes will get less, but the land itself is to be divided by lot. So let's continue with Numbers 26, 57 through 65. The next uh, couple paragraphs, these go together. Numbers 26, <clears throat> verses 57 through 65. These are those who were numbered of the Levites, according to their families, of Gershon, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, 
of Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of Levi, the family of the Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Malites, the family of the Mushites, the family of the Kohathites. Kohath became the father of Amram. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And she bore to Amram. Aaron and Moses and their sister Miriam. To Aaron were born Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. Those who were numbered of them were 23,000, every male from a month old and upward, for they were not numbered among the sons of Israel, since no inheritance was given to them among the sons of Israel. These are those who were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, who numbered the sons of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. But among, those, <clears throat> but among these there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest, who numbered the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And not a man was left of them except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. As you may remember, the Levites were not numbered among the fighting men, so these men are separate. Their full-time job was not to serve as soldiers. Their full-time job was to serve as priests. This was important, and so God set aside an entire tribe to do this. They would be serving all of the tribes. And so here in this paragraph, we have some special instructions for the Levites, and they're numbered separately. As with the other tribes, we've got the family tree, We've got the historical note about Nadab and Abihu being killed for offering unauthorized fire before the Lord. And the total of the males in the tribe of Levi is 23,000 at this point. And then we've got the reminder that they are not given any land. Again, they were to disperse themselves among the tribes with a focus on moving around and then also serving in and around the tabernacle itself. Well, in the rest of this passage, we have the reminder that there has been a complete turnover in the men who were numbered 40 years earlier as compared or contrasted to those who are numbered here. No one was counted in this census that had been counted in the previous census with the only exceptions being Joshua and Caleb. And I don't know whether we've thought about this from a practical point of view, but Joshua and Caleb as I understand it, would have been significantly older than everybody else at this point. They would have been the grandpas of the nation in a sense. So all of their peers of dead are dead. And, and they are now dealing with the children and the grandchildren of those who first crossed over the Red Sea. These two are the only ones left from that previous generation. So let's continue with Numbers 27 where we have something of a test case. So we're just going to look at one more chapter of Numbers 27 tonight. Let's start by looking at verses 1 through 11. Numbers 27, 1 through 11. Then the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Macher, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, came near. And these are the names of his daughters, Malah, Noah, and Hoglah, and Milcah, and Terzah. They stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the leaders and all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, yet he was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord and the company of Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be withdrawn from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in their statements. You shall surely give them a hereditary possession among their father's brothers, and you shall transfer the inheritance of their father to them. Further, you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his nearest relative in his own family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be a statutory ordinance to the sons of Israel, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So we have some women whose dad had died in the wilderness, and it seems as if the law had maybe overlooked them, 
or at least they couldn't find what they needed to find, and the law didn't seem fair to them, and so they approach Moses. They approach Eleazar the priest, and they're there before the people at the doorway of the tabernacle, and they ask about this issue. And I don't know about you, but I just find it interesting that these women feel as if Moses is approachable. And I, and I think that's important for us to note here. Moses is open to hearing from these women. You know, his job, going back 40 years now, is to hear tough cases. And this is certainly a difficult case. This is something that may not have been uh, addressed in the law completely. So their dad died. They've got no brothers. The law said, I think the inheritance would go to the oldest son. And, and so they're concerned. These young ladies are, you know, basically, does this mean that our, that our family ceases to exist? Are we doomed to live in poverty from here on out? Is this the end of the line? And it's a valid concern, isn't it? And so Moses hears this case, and he brings this case to the Lord directly. If you remember, there was a time when Moses heard all the cases, and then he kind of divided things up at the insistence of his father-in-law Jethro, and kind of had other people handle some of the cases, and the hard stuff would make it to him. So he ended up being kind of like the Supreme Court. So maybe this went through other uh, routes before it got to this point. I don't know. But the Lord's response is, yes, these women do have a, uh, have a good point. And so the ruling from God, and then passed down through Moses, is that, yes, these women are, in fact, entitled to their father's inheritance. In fact, this goes for everybody. And this clarification to the law is issued publicly. And again, I just love the fact that Moses is approachable here. Remember, he's dealing with two to three million people. He's dealt with 40 years of whining and rebellion in the wilderness. He's been camping out for 40 years. He's near the end of his life. God just told him he's about to die. He can't cross over the promised land himself. And so Moses at this point very easily could have justified saying, not my problem. And he could have ignored these women, but he doesn't. He listens to them. He takes this case to God. They make an adjustment. God makes an adjustment for everybody in a similar situation going forward. So I don't know about you. I'm, I'm impressed by that. I think uh, Moses handled it well, and I'm glad he took the time to listen to the uh, concern that these women brought. And so speaking of Moses, let's continue with uh, Numbers 27, 12 through 23. Numbers 27, 12 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up to this mountain of Abarim and see the land which I have given to the sons of Israel. When you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother was. For in the wilderness of Zin, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to treat me as holy before their eyes at the water. These are the waters of Meribah of Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them, and who will lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, and have him stand before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, and commission him in their sight. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Moreover, he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his command they shall go out, and at his command they shall come in, both he and the sons of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Moses did just as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Starting in verse 12, God explains how he wants Moses to go up on a mountain where he can look over into the promised land. But notice he also explains that once he does this, Moses will be gathered to his people. And his people are dead. So God is basically saying, this is it. I'm giving you this chance at least to see the promised land, and then you're going to die. And God explains once again the reason why Moses cannot cross the Jordan River. God acknowledges that it was a stressful situation back then, but ultimately God, or rather Moses, did not treat God as holy. That was in the incident where God told Moses to speak to the rock to get water out of it. But Moses strikes the rock instead as he had done previously. 
And so I just, I know we've studied that before, but I would just note Moses presumes something as to the method of getting water out of the rock. He kind of skipped over something there, but also I think as we learned a few weeks ago, uh, Moses got kind of arrogant in that incident. And I'm just kind of paraphrasing here from memory, but basically, look now, you rebels, what I'm about to do for all you people. And so he was kind of taking that glory to himself, not giving that to God or something along those lines. And so he did not treat God as being holy. He was not respectful as he should have been. Well, at this point, seeing that his time on earth is coming to an end, let's notice that Moses immediately responds by coming to God now with a concern. He asks God to appoint someone to lead in his place. And his concern is that the people without him would be like sheep without a shepherd. And if we think about that, Didn't Jesus have a similar concern when he came to this earth? He could look around and he could see that his people were like sheep without a shepherd. And I remember um, earlier, uh, um, well, in history, um, God said, I think it's not coming until Deuteronomy, but God said that he would raise up a prophet like Moses in the future. Jesus is the prophet like Moses, and we've got that confirmed for us in the book of Acts. But there's a lot about Jesus that we can see Uh, previewed for us in Moses, and this concern that the people would be without a shepherd is one of those things. And so uh, Moses, I'm just saying, is definitely not just in this for himself. He's genuinely concerned about what will happen to the people when he's gone. The people need some stable continuation of leadership. Well, in response, notice here God tells Moses to appoint Joshua. So he is to lay his hand on Joshua. He is to do this publicly as a sign that Joshua is the guy. So they are to do this openly. Joshua is God's appointed leader. Joshua is leading with Moses' blessing, with Moses' authority. And the people are to submit to Joshua's leadership just as they submitted to Moses. And this is what Moses does. He appoints Joshua publicly as the next leader. And one thing I find interesting here is that there is some overlap here. In other words, it doesn't just go straight from Moses to Joshua. It's not like Moses dies and then Joshua steps in, but there is some overlap. Uh, Joshua has been Moses' assistant for many years. He was there back during the battle with the Amalekites many years back. Joshua was one of the original 12 spies. Joshua was a military leader and advisor to Moses and, and on and on. And so now, as I see this, Joshua and Moses will lead together for at least a short time. So God says to Moses, give him some of your authority. So don't just turn it over, but you two are going to uh, lead together at least for a little bit. Some of you may remember uh, back when we first started talking about bringing John Long on as an elder, and as we were preparing for my dad to step down from the eldership, Uh, at least among the eldership, we thought that it was important that if at all possible that John and my dad could serve together uh, for at least a time, uh, to have that sense of continuity of leadership within the congregation. And so that's why we did what we did. And I do think there was a value in that. And, And I think that's what's going on with Moses and Joshua here. It just wasn't a clean break from one leader to the next. Uh, but they shared that responsibility for at least a a short time. There might have been a little bit of on-the-job training uh, going on here where they could work together for a short time. So that brings us to the end of uh, Numbers chapter 27. We've had the final census. We've had just a little bit of a preview of this transition from Moses to Joshua. And I think this seems to be a good place for us to pause for a week. And next week, we'll get a few more chapters in. I think we're going to look at chapters 28, 29, and 30 at least. We might move into chapter 31 as well. Uh, So feel free to read ahead. That's where we're headed. As always, thanks for being with us tonight. Again, if there's anything that we need to be praying about as a church or personally, if there's some way we can help or encourage you spiritually, we want you to get in touch. Reach out by sending an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful tonight for your leadership over us. We're thankful for your wisdom, for your protection. We're thankful that you are our shepherd, that you look out for us, that you guard over our souls. We're thankful for those who serve as overseers of the congregation. We're thankful for those who serve as deacons and teachers and song leaders. 
We're thankful for all who serve in every way. So many things are done on a weekly basis, and we're thankful for your people who step up and do the difficult work. We pray for those tonight who are still recovering from falls and illnesses and various surgeries. And we know we're living in frail human bodies and, and the weakness of the flesh that we're living in is such a reminder to us to prepare for the life that's coming after this one. But we pray that you would bless them, that they are, uh, that as they're suffering, that they would not get discouraged, but that they would be reminded all the time that their hope is in you. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.